In addition to the usual challenges of cardiac surgery, sur surgical treatment of the aortic arch involves the additional challenge of safely protecting the brain during inevitable periods of interruption of normal cerebral perfusion. Owing to the exquisite sensitivity of neurologic tissue to ischemic injury, this is not a trivial uh, problem, and over the years we have devoted substantial effort to evaluating our clinical results as well as studying this problem in the animal laboratory in an effort to, uh, to understand the optimal uh, techniques for protecting the brain uh, during surgery of the aortic arch. Shown in this slide are my collaborators. On the left side are the surgeons who I have had the privilege to work with over the years and each of whom has made significant contributions to this work. And in the right two columns are the senior fellows in our research laboratory who over the years have carried out uh, the experimental studies on uh, brain protection. The cardiac surgeons recognize <clears throat> three primary techniques for protection of the brain during aortic arch surgery. <clears throat> Deep hypothermic circuitry arrest was uh, first used by us in the early 1970s and reported in a series of uh, aortic arch resections. Retrograde cerebral perfusion was introduced by Ueda in 1990 and later championed by Takamoto and Safi. And anterograde cerebral perfusion, or as it's sometimes called selective cerebral perfusion, or SCP, was described by Frist in 1986 and then further developed and, champ and popularized by Bechet and Kazooie. This is a diagram taken from uh, one of our first papers uh, depicting our uh, initial technique. Uh, during a period of perfusion, perfusion cooling, any surgical procedures required on the ascending aorta, aortic valve, were carried out during a period of aortic cross clamping. The circulation was then arrested once a sufficient degree of hypothermia had been achieved. And the first step of the arch, consist, arch replacement consisted of placement of an inverted graft within the descending thoracic aorta with a circumferential anastomosis of the two structures. The graft was then withdrawn from the descending thoracic aorta and an island of arch tissue was uh, sewn to it, its superior aspect. This graft could then be clamped, perfusion restored, and the remainder of the procedure carried out. Well, in our initial uh, clinical series, and based on some preliminary laboratory studies, we felt that interruption of the cerebral circulation for a period of up to an hour at profoundly hypothermic levels was safe. As time went on, however, we began to notice that, occasionally, that some patients did not awaken as promptly from surgery as other cardiac surgery patients. And as we started measuring cerebral metabolic rates in the animal laboratory, both in the uh, dog and then in the pig, uh, we began to have some doubts about the safety of hypothermic circuitry arrest for prolonged periods. This is a study carried out in 37 adult patients who required surgical procedures during which periods of hypothermic perfusion were required. We could then measure cerebral, re relative cerebral metabolic rate at various temperatures. And this graph is a compilation of those data from those 37 patients. The vertical orange bars show the uh, cerebral metabolic rate for oxygen uh, uh, expressed as a percentage of the uh, oxygen consumption at normal thermium. And as you can see, one has to get down to fairly profound profoundly hypothermic levels uh, before the metabolic rate falls below 20 or 25 percent. The yellow line depicts the assumed duration of safe hypothermic circuitry rest based on these cerebral metabolic rates uh, with the understanding that the protection afforded by hypothermia is solely provided by a reduction in metabolic rate. <clears throat> 
as one can see, one can get to levels of uh, one can go to 25 to 30 minutes uh, at uh, profoundly uh, hypothermic levels, but at lesser degrees of hypothermia, uh, circuitry rest periods uh, must not, should be limited. Now, in addition to this study and the study that uh, studies that we had done of the two animal species, there were additional data that suggested to us that hypothermic circuitry rest for more than 30 minutes might not be entirely safe. I have mentioned cerebral oxygen consumption. As we uh, prospectively gathered data on awakening from surgery, cerebral function immediately post-op, uh, we described a, a syndrome which we call temporary neurological dysfunction consisting of slow awakening, confusion that eventually cleared but that could be quantitated in the early post-operative period. And what we found was that patients who had been subjected to periods of hypothermic circulatory rest longer than about 30 minutes had an increased incidence and severity of temporary neurological dysfunction. Finally, we, in another series of patients, we carried out careful cognitive testing preoperatively and six weeks postoperatively and found again that between 25 and 30 minutes uh, there was a change in cognitive function postoperatively that was not present in those patients who had had less than 25 minutes of hypothermic circuitry rest. And now retrograde cerebral perfusion offered a um, uh, substantial promise in the early 1990s. It was a simple technique, did not interfere with the surgical procedure, and we as well as others began uh, looking at it both clinically and experimentally. Uh, our experimental studies uh, eventually led us to uh, doubt that retrograde cerebral perfusion was of much utility in actual protect actual uh, provision of metabolic substrate to the brain. But this final uh, experimental study that we carried out uh, was what we considered to be the uh, last nail in the coffin, if you will. We found that of every 100 cc's of blood that was injected or flowed into the superior vena cava, uh, less, only about one one hundredth of one percent traversed the cerebral capillaries in the brain. And this was ascertained by uh, introducing microspheres into the blood as it was uh, uh, perfused into the superior vena cava, and then recovering blood from the, ver from the various returns and assaying for the presence of microspheres. The brain was then removed and the uh, spheres that had been, that were trapped in the cerebral capillaries were also measured. And as you can see, of 100 cc's that goes in, uh, 90 cc's returns through venovenous shunts through the inferior vena cava. This blood still has its, still had the spheres in, in the blood, suggesting it had not traversed a capillary bed. About a tenth of the blood comes back retrograde through the ascending aorta, and uh, a fair amount of this has traversed capillary beds as evidenced by a reduction in the number of, shunt, of, of microspheres. But again, when one actually looks at the brain, only a tiny fraction uh, has uh, perfused the brain. So based on our laboratory studies uh, of retrograde cerebral perfusion, uh, we came to these conclusions. RCP will cool the brain. It is. It will. It can and will wash out air and non-impacted particulate emboli from large and small arteries. It does not provide nutrient flow to the brain parenchyma. And if perfusion pressure is sufficiently elevated, probably above 25 or 30, significant cerebral edema occurs, and cerebral injury can occur from the technique of RCP alone. Now, in the, looking back at our experience in, through about the 1990s, uh, Dr. Ha Hoggle uh, tried to make a comparison of our results utilizing the three primary techniques for uh, cerebral protection. 
as you can see here, looking at our entire series of patients uh, over that time, a, a simple comparison would not be very fair since the HCA patients uh, were all had relatively short periods of interruption of normal cerebral perfusion. And uh, anti-grade cerebral perfusion, for example, had only long periods of interruption of selective cerebral perfusion. There uh, were, however, a uh, uh, substantial number of patients in the group from 40 to 80 minutes of interruption of um, normal cerebral perfusion in all three groups, which allowed a comparison to be made. This is sort of a poor man's uh, propensity analysis. And so those patients who had had between 40 and 80 minutes of uh, interruption of, circuit, of normal circulation were compared. Now here are, the re here are the results of stroke in these three groups of patients. These are a little higher than we had hoped to see. We looked at all the patients, the stroke rate in all three groups was between about 10 and 15 percent and was not and did not differ. An interesting finding, however, was the fact that in the uh, hypothermic group and in the hypothermia with anti-grade cerebral perfusion, only about half of the patients that sustained discrete uh, focal deficits were symptomatic at the time of discharge, and the other half the symptoms had cleared. Whereas in the patients that had had retrograde cerebral perfusion, all of the, stro all of the patients were still symptomatic at the time of discharge, suggesting perhaps that uh, small, smaller strokes might be might be made larger uh, with the addition uh, if the cerebral protection technique was retrograde perfusion. When one looked at uh, temporary neurological dysfunction, the syndrome that I described previously, you see the incidence is quite high in all these groups. These are long periods of interruption of normal cerebral uh, blood flow, but that uh, the incidence in the patients in whom anti-grade cell perfusion had been utilized was significantly lower with an odds ratio of about 0.3 than the other two groups, again suggesting that anti-grade cell perfusion uh, was superior to the other two uh, for these longer periods of uh, cerebral protection. Well, if one accepts that uh, anti-grade or selective cerebral perfusion uh, is the preferable technique, there still remains a question of what are the optimal parameters for carrying out uh, selective, an selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion. Now, owing to clinical heterogeneity, it's almost impossible to answer this sort of question um, clinically. And uh, we carry, have carried out a number of carefully controlled experiments with the juvenile pig utilizing randomized contemporary controls. Uh, to try and answer these questions. This is a schematic of one of these uh, experiments, the, um, uh, asking the question of what is the optimal temperature of the perfusate during selective cerebral perfusion. And uh, these four groups of animals that were cooled on cardiopulmonary bypass and then had selective cerebral perfusion for an hour at the four temperatures, 10, 15, 20, and 25 degrees. They're then uh, warmed on cardiopulmonary bypass, weaned, uh, awakened, and evaluated clinically, and in some cases histologically, postoperatively. Now our postoperative assessment consists of daily videotape, videotaping of each animal. These tapes are then uh, coded and given to an observer who uh, has experience in evaluating uh, neurological function in pigs, but uh, he is unaware of the uh, experimental treatment or, or the day of um, after surgery. These uh, scores are then compiled for the uh, various groups of animals. And here you can see that this is evaluation on a 12-point scale, and you can see that preoperatively all the animals are normal. And uh, there is a uh, decrease in behavioral uh, score during the first few days after surgery, but almost all of the animals and have returned to normal by postoperative day seven. There is, however, a significant difference in neurological functioning in these uh, animals uh, between the two groups 
the lower temperature group 10 and 15 degrees and the higher temperature group of 20 to 25 degrees. These differences are significant uh, for days 4, 5, and 6 after uh, surgery, suggesting that the optimal temperature is uh, one of the two lower ones. Now, this is an example of a number of experiments that have been carried out, the results of which are uh, summarized here. On this slide, ACP and SCP are used interchangeably. As you can see, as shown in the first experiment that I described to you, uh, ACP at 10 or 15 degrees provided better cerebral protection than it did at 20 or 25 degrees. Antigrade cerebral perfusion at 50 or 70 tor provides superior cerebral protection uh, to perfusion at 90 tor. Some degree of autoregulation is lost at these colder temperatures and the higher perfusion pressure probably results in uh, excess perfusion. Antigrade cerebral perfusion with pH stat management doubles cerebral blood flow compared to uh, flow with alpha stat management. The, there is no change, the two have equivalent um, uh, degrees of cerebral protection, and so the uh, excess flow that one gets with uh, pH management uh, would appear to confer no benefit. And in the clinical situation in which the probability of emboli is probably at least in part related to the amount of flow going to the brain, uh, the high flow would probably be. Uh, detrimental. And finally, uh, selective cerebral fusion with a hematocrit of 30 provides superior protection to that with a lower hematocrit. The mechanism for this improvement is certainly not oxygen carrying capacity. Ox adequate oxygen is carried at these low temperatures at a hematocrit of 20, but this is an observation that has been observed also in children being operated on with hypothermic circuitry arrest. And uh, uh, clearly uh, is a real phenomenon. So what are the optimal parameters then for antigrade cerebral perfusion? A perfuse temperature between 10 and 15 degrees, pressure of 50 to 70 tor, pH management should be alpha stat, and the hematocrit if possible should be greater than 30. Now, there's been a substantial interest in the past decade or so uh, in using antigrade cell perfusion with a higher perfuse temperature. Now, this is a compilation of a group of studies that coincidentally were all published in 2007, uh, comparing the results, uh, if you will, as a function of uh, perfuse temperature that's in the uh, red line near the top, varying from 26 degrees in, in uh, uh, the Hanover series to 16 degrees in our own series. Also shown in the second red line is the period of lower body hypothermic circulatory arrest, since the lower body is, is not perfused. And this again varies between an average of 50 minutes and almost 100 minutes. The results are reasonably equivalent. Mortality is in the low uh, teens or single digits, and stroke is in the low um, single digits as well. Of interest, however, is um, uh, some of the results in the first study listed on the left. And that is, those patients who had lower body hypothermic rest periods of greater than 60 minutes, the mortality uh, increased to 27 percent. In addition, 18 percent of the patients experienced paraplegia. Paraplegia has been almost unknown in our series of um, uh, ARCH patients. Uh, but clearly there appears to be some uh, risk to the spinal cord with the higher perfusion temperatures. The major reason for uh, going to higher perfusion uh, temperatures, in addition to perhaps shortening the duration of the operation somewhat, is the belief that it will reduce coagulopathy postoperatively. 
uh, take back for bleeding is only reported in three of these series, but you can see that uh, the comparison of the very uh, profound level of hypothermia at 16 degrees did not, certainly did not result in any increase in uh, the instance of bleeding, suggesting that the issue of coagulopathy is not necessarily a function solely of perfusate temperature, and that uh, one not, need not uh, avoid it, avoid profound hypothermic levels if they're felt to be uh, useful uh, because one because of the danger of coagulopathy. Now we uh, decided to look at the uh, issue of spinal cord protection with uh, selective cerebral perfusion at higher temperatures in the experimental laboratory. And this is a graph of the blood flow in the spinal cord in animals undergoing uh, selective cerebral perfusion. The uh, light blue line is the uh, baseline series, baseline blood flows. These are expressed on the horizontal axis as a position along the spinal cord from C1 down to L5. And then the red lines represent uh, uh, blood flow during selective cerebral perfusion. And one can see that uh, once you get down to the lower thoracic cord, that there's very little blood flow uh, to the lower spinal cord. Indeed, below T8 in the experimental animal, there's essentially uh, uh, no flow. So the lower portion of the spinal cord is uh, experiencing circulatory rest, although the brain uh, is being perfused. And this is a graph of histological damage seen in the spinal cord uh, with antegrade cerebral perfusion at 28 degrees uh, during, during two periods of time, one 90 minutes and one 120 minutes. And one can see that the upper spinal cord cervical and most of the thoracic cord as well uh, shows no histological damage but uh, in the lower cord there is quite uh, substantial histological damage and indeed in these uh, small groups of experimental animals in those with 120 minutes of uh, selective cerebral perfusion at 28 degrees, all were paraplegic, and in the 90-minute group, uh, the majority uh, were clinically paraplegic. Turning back to uh, uh, techniques, surgical techniques and their influence on cerebral uh, protection, uh, we recognized that if one was going to uh, limit the period of hypothermic circulatory rest that to 30 minutes or less, that other techniques uh, than our initial one uh, would be preferable. This technique was developed in the late 80s and early 90s, primarily by Dr. Ergen, in which the uh, first part of the arch operation consisted of an astomosis of a beveled graft to the island of arch tissue. And then this graft could be perfused as soon as this single anastomosis was done, uh, limiting arrest periods to easily under 30 minutes. The rest of the operation could then be carried out, and then the uh, graft perfusing the brain connected to the uh, main graft without a, with uh, either a short period of circuitry rest or none at all. This technique was then modified by Dr. Spielogel into the what we call the trifurcation graft, in which small grafts are utilized for the arch vessels, uh, simplifying the operation, allowing resection of atherosclerotic material in the proximal arch vessels, and uh, reducing the incidence of bleeding uh, owing to the um, small diameter of the anastomoses. This technique also has the advantage that the arch vessel perfusion can be translocated to the ascending aorta, 
And if one uses an elephant trunk in a two-stage procedure, with the second stage either being uh, endovascular or surgical, uh, the first procedure really can be limited uh, to the ascending aorta, uh, reducing the chance of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and uh, in many cases making the procedure faster and easier. These are the results of our first 150 patients in which the trifurcated graft was utilized. And you can see the results are uh, quite satisfactory, although we still did experience uh, some patients with, uh, that had embolic strokes. Nonetheless, the overall mortality was less than 5%. Perfusion uh, site has emerged as an important uh, issue in, uh, aor in uh, <coughs> cardiac surgery in general and uh, certainly in aortic surgery. <coughs> we switched to, uh, or made a switch over to axillary artery cannulation uh, in the late 90s. This is, this is a technique that can be utilized in a number of ways. Our preferred technique is simply a right angle cannula with occlusion of the distal. Um, subclavian artery during perfusion. Uh, there are those who feel that a uh, side to end to side graft is a superior technique. Uh, primarily, in my judgment, is a matter of uh, which how the technique is utilized. An attempt to uh, ascertain whether the axillary cannulation was a safer one, uh, Dr. Etzen. Uh, looked at our experience over about a 16-year uh, period on primarily ascending a aortic surgery of about 900 patients and looked at results as a function of the site of uh, arterial cannulation. This is the patient series. And here are the results. With the re results reported as adverse outcome of either stroke or death, uh, in the groups as a function of cannulation site and etiology. And as you can see in the group with atherosclerotic aneurysms, the incidence of adverse outcome was reduced from 12 and 20 percent to 3 percent with the use of axillary cannulation. The other group shown here had some modest reductions, uh, but one per, one when one lumped all the groups together, there was a significant difference in the incidence of adverse outcome, although indeed uh, most of this difference was, of course, accounted for by the uh, group with atherosclerosis. Now, in terms of how one carries out selective cerebral perfusion, there is still an ongoing debate of whether perfusion of the anominate artery alone is sufficient. If uh, or whether it's necessary to perfuse the anomalous in the left carotid or all three of the arch vessels. Um, if a vessel is non-perfused, uh, some surgeons feel it should be clamped to prevent steel. I am certainly among that group of surgeons. Uh, and there is ongoing debate as to whether balloon-tipped catheters, uh, which can be inserted into the vessels and shorten the interval of hypothermic circulatory arrest, but perhaps carry some increased uh, risk of particulate embolization, uh, whether this is a technique uh, to be used routinely or not. There's also the uh, technique which we prefer is a rapid connection of the arch vessels to a trifurcated or multiple branched graft during a period of hypothermic circulatory rest, and then perfusion of the graft via uh, 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 catheter placed in the graft itself or via the axillary artery, uh, perfusing all of the um, uh, arch vessels with a single input. We feel there are some advantages to this. Uh, it simplifies uh, pressure monitoring, usually a radial artery catheter in the, in the side contralateral to the axillary artery cannula is sufficient. And there is no need for individual pressure monitoring, flow monitoring uh, in uh, individual balloon-tipped catheters. The risk of uh, hypo or hy hyper or hypoperfusion of one cerebral hemisphere is obviated, and uh, one does not necessarily need to monitor this then with uh, 
uh, nears or, or bilateral transcranial Doppler uh, to assure uh, perfusion of both uh, cerebral hemispheres. The left subclavian artery is uh, frequently the most difficult one to deal with in arch replacements. And uh, with modern imaging techniques, it's usually possible to predict which ones will, will, will prove to be surgically challenging. Uh, we think uh, if we encounter such a problem, which is actually quite frequent, that it's wise to do a preoperative subclavian carotid bypass, a translocation with subclavian occlusion proximal to the left vertebral artery. This can be done as an early as initial part of the operation. We prefer to do it several days earlier. Uh, second uh, option is the uh, dissection of the left axillary artery uh, beneath the left clavicle and then uh, an anastomosis of a graft to it at this site with passage of the graft uh, transthoracically to the ascending aorta. And finally, in an emergency situation in which the subclavian artery cannot be uh, easily anastomosed. It is uh, acceptable to uh, ligate it, uh, but one must uh, understand that uh, the incidence of spinal cord injury may be somewhat increased, particularly if one uses uh, a long elephant trunk. Finally, our conclusions of uh, several decades of work and uh, surgical treatment of aortic arch disease are listed here. Uh, certainly with regard to cannulation, we believe that data at the present time support the position that it's mandatory uh, in atherosclerotic aneurysms, and it's probably preferable in all other aneurysm types. With regard to perfusion, uh, we believe that experimental and clinical evidence strongly uh, supports the idea that HCA is not advisable for more than 30 minutes. There certainly are situations in which uh, uh, the surgical situation demands that it, uh, or that it occur, but we certainly not believe that operations should be planned uh, to use intervals longer than 30 minutes. RCP, we believe, uh, can help with cooling, but not O2 delivery, and we think it's primarily of historical interest at the present time. Antigrade or selective cerebral perfusion, we believe, is the preferable technique. We uh, believe the perfusion parameters established by laboratory studies uh, certainly serve at least as a starting point as to where one, uh, what one uses clinically. We think three-vessel perfusion is safer. Uh, then two-vessel or one-vessel perfusion. And finally, uh, spinal cord ischemia must be considered uh, if one is going to carry out a prolonged antigrade cerebral perfusion at moderately hypothermic temperatures. Thank you for your attention.